Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the th third update of ACLED's Conflict Index and for the uh, unveiling of the 2024 ACLED watchlist of uh, 10 countries that we think should be looked at more carefully. Uh, we've got a, a, an hour with you today, and uh, we're going to split that into two parts. The first part will be uh, three ACLED experts. Our founder and president, Tina Rally, will give a, an overview, and then we'll move over to Katayun Kishi, our head of data science, who will tell you about the conflict index. And then finally, we'll talk to uh, Andrea Carboni, who's the head of analysis, and he's going to look at the 10 countries on the watch list and uh, whether there are any common themes between them all. And uh, so we are recording the show. Uh, please do put any questions in the Q&A, uh, we'll, and we will come to them in the second part after about 35 minutes. So um, without further ado, over to you, Kleena. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. Again, this is our annual conflict index that we introduced last year, and we also have been working on the methodology, and we're really thrilled to be able to present it to you today with our 10 conflicts. So next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about what the index aims to do. And so what we're trying to do, of course, is assess every country and territory according not just to event numbers, but really to four indicators that we think are particularly important when it comes to assessing violence, which is deadliness, which is the fatality rate, danger to civilians, geographic diffusion, and fragmentation. So this really underscores that ACLED has been working now for many years to not just account for all of the violence that is happening in the world, but also to emphasize that the type of violence that's happening has been rapidly changing. And these four indicators give us some indication of how that is changing. And so what you'll see here is, of course, we have we cover more than 240 territories and countries, and the majority of those saw at least one act of conflict in the last 12 months. We have a huge number of politically violent events that, that of course, are available to the public, 139,000, of which 147,000 fatalities occurred therein. But really what we're trying to do here is assess what conflicts are extreme, according to those first four indicators I noted, which are high, which are turbulent, and which are low and inactive. And so what we were able to do here is display for you really where they where they live on the spectrum or of more or less conflict. And this has a lot of significance in terms of how conflicts might be mitigated or what you can do in, in many ways to respond to those. Next, please. Okay, so one of the things that we would like to emphasize here is that there has been quite a drastic increase in conflict, especially since the, the pandemic period of 2020, 2021. So if we were to look at just that period to now, there has been an increase of over 40%. But really what we want to focus on is the fact that there's not just been a significant increase year on year. So for example, from last year to this year, there's been an increase of 12%. But the types of conflict that we're seeing, especially the types of conflict that are proliferating, tend to be really multiple overlapping concurrent violent contests. So there's geopolitical contests that we're seeing, of course, in Ukraine and Gaza. But there are also many, many local contests, which in aggregate, make up a tremendous amount of conflict. And those are really what's driving these numbers, even though, of course, the Ukraines and the Gazas are making up significant amount of, of, um, of conflict. Here is very important to emphasize to you kind of the geographic spread of what we're looking at. Again, these are colored according to our index of extreme, high, turbulent, low, and inactive. What we can see here is of the extremely violent countries, only two are in Africa, which tends to become, it tends to be quite a surprise to people, both Nigeria and Sudan. Sudan especially, of course, because of the conflicts that has been occurring since April of last year. Three are in the Middle East, um, Palestine, Yemen, and Syria, all of which have significant entrenched violent contests that look unlikely to be solved this year. Myanmar is the sole Asian country that we classify as extremely violent. But what's really, I think, quite different about how we assess violence compared to others, of course, is that we see that four countries are in Latin America. And then Mexico, of course. There's Mexico, Colombia, Haiti, and Brazil. Now, many of those countries 
would not be typically what people would consider to be con conflicted states. But if you look at, for example, how Mexico has the highest rate of, of threat to civilians or danger to civilians, as we call it, in the world outside of Gaza in the last few months, it really underscores how a lot of this forms of violence that we're currently seeing don't look like insurgencies or more traditional violent contests. They've morphed in form. And in doing so, they're almost unseen by typical ways that we would have typically measured conflict. Next, please. And one of the most important ways to consider that, of course, is to look at these relative to levels of development. We have, pardon me, we have very, we have countries in conflict in very high development countries and countries in conflict and of course, more typically low development countries. But what we can see here is that we have distributed our top 50 countries over levels of UN human development categories. And with the exception of the extreme and the very high development, there is a wide range of contexts in which we are seeing recurrent, persistent, and growing violence. In fact, we have found that the, the highest risk of violence or the highest rate of violence is growing in places of middle incomes or democratizing states. Middle incomes and democratizing states or democratizing states. Next slide, please. Here's another example where we have the freedom status by Freedom House. And here, rather than assuming that a lot of the conflict we're seeing is in places that we would classify as not free, instead we see there are, as we mentioned, extremely violent places where they are holding elections, where they have market economies, where they have high levels of representation, high levels of inclusion, and they're still persistently conflicted. And that has a lot to do with really a misdiagnosis of what's driving conflict in these contexts. What's driving contact, these conflicts is political competition. And that is being in some ways shaped and, and adapted to by violent groups, especially in places where there's a very, very high rate of militias and gangs in Colombia and Brazil, Nigeria and Mexico. They really are feeding off of the political system in order to thrive. And we see that across the free, the partially free, and the not free contexts. Next, please. So I did want to, to mention here, of course, is that what we're seeing is that conflict is in fact slightly worsening. I, I mentioned earlier that we are seeing a definite increase in the level of conflict events. Um, year on year, it's a 5% increase, but from last year to this year, it has been 12%, and there's been much more higher percentage since the pandemic. Um, but in terms of those that have seen improvements just in the last year period or even five year periods, there tends to be a balancing of countries that improve and countries that worsen. So we're not going down a particularly positive trajectory when it comes to either engagement with conflicted states or, or countries actually falling into extreme violence. Um, the index, which you're, is available now on our website, can show you exactly what is consistently concerning, which is what makes up the most of these cases, and those that are less violent, um, but, but not markedly so. And one of the imp important ones to mention here, of course, is that Ukraine has gone from being in an extremely violent category to be in a high violence category, but it's not because Ukraine has improved, it's more because other countries have become markedly worse on the four indicators I mentioned before and so have kind of muscled Ukraine out of that um, unfortunate top 10. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand this over now to Dr. Karim Kishi, who's gonna talk a little bit more about these indicators and how they uh, in aggregate have fed our interpretation of conflict. Thanks, Karim. Thanks, Lena. So as Kleena mentioned at the beginning, we have basically four main indicators that we use to construct the conflict index, leanness, danger, diffusion, and fragmentation. And the idea behind using these four indicators is really to stress that looking at conflict and trying to gauge the intensity of conflict and, and violence in areas is not limited to some of the more traditional indicators that you might see um, elsewhere. So looking at just fatalities or just event counts, it's really much more dynamic and um, complex than that. And we try to capture that by using four sort of separate indicators that capture different elements of a conflict. Next slide. 
So first we have deadliness. Deadliness looks at the number of fatalities that result from political violence within the country. So this is your sort of traditional fatalities measure. It's an important indicator, which is why we include it here as well. Um, and in particular, it allows us to measure the human cost of conflict and provides um, a good proxy for the intensity of a conflict. To calculate this indicator, we use the fatalities column of the ACLA data set. Um, and we do want to note that fatality levels are subject to significant biases, underreporting, inflation. This is something that we've discussed in depth in our methodology documents available on our site. And we tend to use the most conservative estimates um, when it comes to fatalities. But this is another reason why we don't only rely on fatality um, as an indicator. And instead, we incorporate three other ones as well. Next slide. So we have danger as well, which looks at specifically the number of violent events that target civilians in the country. So in this case, it's an important indicator to look at because in most all cases, organized groups um, will invoke some level of harm um, onto civilians. And this can be a good sort of uh, marker for when the conditions are changing on the ground, when territory is changing hands, when there's increased levels of group competition and so, for, uh, so forth. So, to look at this, to measure this, we use the civilian targeting column of the ACLA data set. Frequent users of ACLID might uh, remember that we have a violence against civilians event type. This includes those events, but also additional ones as well. So happy to answer any questions about uh, that as well at the end. Next slide. So we then look at diffusion. So here we really want to get at how geographically widespread is the conflict because conflicts can be clustered in certain places, in certain locations, or they can be sort of spread out across the country. And in the latter case, it can make it much more difficult to resolve. Um, you have a lot more ground to cover if you're perhaps the state trying to resolve the conflict. You have perhaps multiple conflicts going on um, in different geographic areas and so forth. So to calculate this, we take a percentage of the 10 by 10 kilometer grids in the country that see a high level of violence. And we only look at populated areas of the country as well. So to do this, we use the geolocated data in the ACLA data set along with population data um, from WorldPOP to create this sort of percentage of the geographic territory affected by high levels of violence. Um, and one thing to note here is that by nature, small countries will typically have a high level of diffusion simply because there's less geographic ground to cover in those areas. Next slide. And then the last indicator is fragmentation. So here we're interested in looking at where are the highly fragmented conflict environments? And those are particularly thorny and difficult to resolve often because you have a lot of players involved. You have a lot of people who need to be involved in any negotiations and any peace agreements. You might have multiple overlapping conflicts. So perhaps these groups have nothing to do with each other and they're fighting independent conflicts within the country, making it that much more difficult to reduce conflict as a whole. So we look at the number of distinct active non-state armed groups. So this would include rebel groups, political militias, identity militias in the country. Um, we use the actor columns of the ACLA data set. So those are your primary actor columns, actor one and two, and then associated actors as well. Um, and one thing to note is that unidentified armed groups are not included in this measure. And we also try to mitigate for areas that have a huge number of communal militias by limiting that number to just one per admin one. We also do include pro-government militias in this category. Next slide. So in terms of how we actually calculate the rankings, this is a bit of a, a nested procedure. So the first thing that happens is each country is ranked within each of the four indicators that I just went over. So perhaps the country ranks third in deadliness, 10th in diffusion, fourth in danger, and seventh in fragmentation overall. Next, we take those four rankings for the country and create an average of them. So in this case, the average would be six. We take that average then for each country and then rank those to come up with our final ranking. So if the country's average was about a six, when we rank it, that perhaps makes it fall into our third overall ranking category. It just depends what the other averages are from the other countries. So that's the overall ranking procedure. Next slide. So the last thing I wanna show is our interactive tool that we have on the website um, that allows you to really sort of dive in and play around with the data. So on the left-hand side, you have a, an area where you can select countries and compare and kind of see how they stack up next to each other. So 
In the example here, we have Myanmar, Syria, and Palestine. And you can see, for example, that Palestine ranks very high on the diffusion scale, um, but not so high perhaps on fragmentation. Whereas Myanmar, the orange line, um, shows really high levels of fragmentation, but less levels of diffusion um, and slightly less danger and deadliness. So you can pick and choose up to five different countries to compare here, and then you can really quickly visualize how their conflicts are different from each other. On the right hand side, you have a table with all of our uh, index rankings and results. So you can see the category that the country falls into, where it ranked, and then also within each indicator where it ranked as well. And this is filterable, searchable, sortable, et cetera. And the last thing is at the top next to the title, you'll see the download full data button. That will allow you to download all of the scores. So you can see all the rankings here, as well as um, sort of the raw scores for each country as well. Next slide. Great, I'll pass it on to Andrea to discuss the conflict watch list. Thank you, Katalyun. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, alongside the conflict index, uh, we also present in our, another annual uh, publication, our conflict watch list, uh, where uh, we identify crises that we expect to move in uh, new directions or experience major shifts in, in conflict dynamics. In, uh, um, throughout this year. Um, these uh, new trajectories or shifts are not just reflected on uh, what we observe in terms of patterns of conflict, but have also major ramifications when it comes to the prospects for conflict resolution, uh, escalation, or uh, termination. Um, now, when producing such uh, lists, such a uh, watch list, uh, you're always faced with the choice of deciding what should or should not be included and according also to which indicators. And those excluded are often even more significant than those uh, included for uh, a host of reasons. Uh, now, uh, in making our selection for uh, this year's uh, conflict watch list, we decided to combine the inputs from our conflict index including, for example, uh, countries that feature especially high on the four uh, dimensions um, of, the, of the index that was uh, outlined by uh, Katayun early on, with a focus on uh, other crises that by virtue of significant political developments that are expected to happen over the year may reclaim a, a, an ever more central role in regional and global uh, conflict dynamics. Um, if we go to the ne next slide, um, uh, sorry, several indicators show that conflict, as also Cleona mentioned, got uh, remarkably worse in 2023 and again, uh, over the past few years. Whether we refer to the number of people who die as a result of violence or are exposed to conflict uh, are displaced from, from their homes or are in need of humanitarian aid, all these measures point to a significant degradation of conflict uh, around the world. Um, last year, we observed, of course, the outbreak of major conflicts in uh, Sudan and in Gaza, both marked by accusations of uh, genocide, ethnic cleansing, uh, Palestine is uh, featuring in, in our index in the first three positions in at least uh, three different indicators, which is uh, diffusion, of course, for the sheer uh, uh, for the sheer devastation brought to, to Gaza in particular, uh, but also the danger uh, posed by conflict to civilians and the deadliness, so uh, how many uh, fatalities were, were recorded. Um, other conflicts, like those unfolding unabated in Ukraine and Myanmar, for example, continue claiming thousands of lives, and peace efforts seems to uh, seem to achieve very little, if not tangible, uh, any tangible uh, results. Um, and again, Ukraine and Myanmar uh, also feature at the top of the conflict index, according to measures of deadliness and fragmentation, kind of pointing to the continued intensity of, of these conflicts, despite them going on for, for a few years by now. Um, in Yemen, there are uh, concrete hopes of an even longer-awaited peace deal, uh, 
though this is seeming though these are seemingly held up by the regional escalations uh, which is emerging out of the conflict in Gaza which now has one of its hotspots in the in the Red Sea which we included in our uh, conflict uh, watch list expanding from uh, from uh, only uh, Yemen um but we also have uh, political and security crises are becoming ever more entrenched in uh, Haiti uh, and across the Sahel. And in both of these spaces, uh, what we see is that the erosion of democratic institutions or even state institutions overall is happening as state authorities are increasingly grappling, um, struggling to contain the threat uh, from a vast array of armed groups that operate across the political and criminal spheres. This is also one of the major themes uh, in kind of understanding the blurred line between uh, political and criminal, something that is, uh, that is something that we also face in our understanding of uh, what political violence is, for example. Um, and while uh, you also have uh, democratic aspirations uh, being dashed in many, many contexts. 2024 is also described as the biggest election year in, in history with uh, seven out of 10 of the most populous countries in the world from Pakistan to India, Indonesia, Russia, just to mention a few, um, holding national elections this year. Uh, if we don't even want to mention local elections, regional elections on top of those. Um, and they are often, uh, you know, sometimes they are fully democratic processes. Sometimes we see that elections are being held at the expense of democratic standards in a climate of authoritarian repression and through the widespread use of violence by a number of actors, whether it's uh, uh, state, state-backed militias, uh, rebel groups, or even uh, criminal groups attempting to influence the, the outcomes. And this is why we decided to include uh, three countries in particular in which uh, we observe either recent elections or there are forthcoming elections that are likely to leave a lasting legacy also on conflict dynamics. Uh, one is the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, where the regional conflict that has its center probably in the eastern part of the country, but it's also uh, projected uh, more regionally is uh, definitely a test for the contested re-elected president uh, Felix uh, Chisekedi. Um, we have of course Mexico uh, and, and Mexico is of course a state that is featuring very high in, in, in our index when it comes to danger to civilians again for the uh, presence of a number of threats to, to the civilian populations. But we see also state institutions facing ever more sophisticated tactics, weaponry acquired by criminal organizations, which again are uh, maybe uh, attempting to influence the the outcome of the elections, along with other uh, with other groups. And finally, what is uh, <clears throat> probably a little more more striking is, of course, the United States, uh, where of course. Uh, there is a precedent from 2020 where there was a kind of a combination of challenges, uh, multiple sources of unrest, but where uh, calls of election denialism, voting fraud are somehow heightening risks of violence, of violence not only in the run up to, but also in the aftermath of uh, the November uh, polls. And, and, and so kind of heightening uh, threats for American democracy. Um, risks for regional and global security are not limited to these crisis contexts. I, I'd say the you know we have a looming escalation across the Middle East. We have uh, even a danger of direct confrontations between the United States and Russia, the United States and China, or even the most recent crisis between Pakistan and Iran. Uh, we have renewed tensions in. Uh, Ethiopia and in the Horn of Africa, or considering a possible expansion of the jihadist insurgency from the Sahel to coastal West Africa or um, neighboring countries. Uh, we observe a significant degradation of public security in some parts of Central and South America, most notably Ecuador. Uh, they all bear considerable threats, of course, for, for peace around, around the world. Um, 
And I'd say it is, it is of course, easier even to look at the differences that exist among these, these conflicts, um, uh, kind of, but we also believe that there are some kind of cross-cutting underlying uh, themes that we can observe not in all but in most of these these conflicts and one i'd say is uh, the uh, presence of flawed electoral and political competitions understanding competition not something that only happens throughout elections or in democratic contexts but something that involves a much broader understanding of how uh, groups uh, whether operating within or outside the boundary of, of the state, seek, seek to mas- maximize political or economic power. And uh, what we see is, for example, that both local but also international governance structures um, that are uh, trying, I'd say, to contain these conflicts are running behind in their goal of preserving peace or even sustaining peace where that exists or, um, already. And in similar context, the, the kind of the breakdown of peace or uh, of state institutions doesn't occur suddenly. Uh, but we have a number of signs uh, preceding this breakdown. And these can involve, for example, uh, the takeover of key local economic infrastructure, the violent targeting of local officials, things that in our data and throughout our analysis, we've also covered in a number in a number of com- of, of contexts, and will continue to to cover. Um, another important theme uh, will um, will concern the role of state and non-state actors, provided this distinction is still useful, actually, in many in many contexts, uh, in carrying out violence. And um, as we saw in the index, uh, we see many conflicts that are drawing in an increasingly large number of armed groups. And that brings a lot of implications for, again, uh, conflict termination, resolution, negotiation. But at the same time, we also see how states continue to possess and are increasingly willing to deploy uh, disproportionate military power, intervening directly in conflict, or supporting allies abroad to advance political economic interests. Um, and I'd say, well, none of these dynamics is intrinsically new, of course. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a much broader trajectory. Many states are now much more willing to project force uh, abroad. And this is driving a staggering increase in uh, conflict debts. Uh, for example, while um, in our data, we observed that the percentage of civilian fatalities attributed to the actions of state forces stood around 16% in 2021, so uh, three years ago. This climbed to over 47% in 2023. And of course, this is attributed to, uh, uh, you know, many of the conflicts that we, uh, we saw, and I mentioned before, Sudan, Gaza, Ukraine, and, and so on. Um, and I, I just want to conclude with a final, I'd say, with, with a final theme here, which is the kind of the catastrophic effect that, of course, uh, conflicts have on civilian populations. And um, uh, we see that several indicators uh, agree that conflicts are claiming an ever higher human toll. Our data, actually data, which we treat uh, always as a, a rough approximation and underestimate uh, for the reasons also Kata Yun was, was mentioning before, show the civilian fatalities, for example, increased by around 30% in 2023 compared to the previous year. This is a, a huge increase. But we can see these increase also reflected elsewhere. For example, uh, if we look at the data of International Displacement Monitoring Center, which tracks displacement globally, we see that the number of displaced people, mostly as a result of war, increased by around 20% from 2021 to 2022. And this is set to further increase uh, in 2020, uh, in 2023. Um, so we are trying to uh, kind of work in this direction and provide a ever more, I'd say, holistic understanding of the effects of of conflict beyond mere casualty data. The index is a first attempt, but uh, kind of a forthcoming project uh, that we will be announcing kind of soon uh, 
uh, is intended to allow users to, to actually uh, understand, measure and monitor population exposure to conflict. And so understanding, uh, you know, uh, what extent of the population is exposed in direct or indirect ways to, to the effects of conflict. Um, I'll just conclude very briefly, uh, setting the kind of the agenda for what we are planning to do uh, this year in terms of, of coverage. Uh, of course, the countries that we identified in the index, uh, the themes will be at the center of our, uh, of our work. We'll continue our conflict observatory special projects, those focusing on Mozambique, on the Horn of Africa, but we'll also launch new ones, uh, focusing on Yemen, on the United States in, in particular. Uh, we'll uh, continue uh, our election watch and actor profile series, so focusing on specific uh, uh, elements of, of conflict, and we'll provide global coverage of election violence, conflict actors throughout, uh, throughout the world. And uh, finally, of course, our regular publications, uh, like our monthly regional overviews. What we try to do there is to provide, uh, of course, context to our regularly updated data and to cover not only the 10 countries, including in this year's uh, watch list, but also you know, the, the full spectrum of, of conflicts uh, around the world. I'll stop here and uh, pass it back on to, to you for the Q&A. Thanks very much, uh, Kleena. Katoon, Andrea, that was great. Hello again from snowy Brussels. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions even before the webinar, uh, a lot about the Middle East, especially about Yemen, uh, about Africa, especially Sudan, South Sudan and the Horn of Africa, especially Ethiopia. Um, uh, but I think I'll start with some very specific questions uh, we've, we've had already. And um, for instance, one which I think I'll direct to Kleena because it's about uh, the question of uh, the geographic distribution of a conflict and how we uh, measure it and uh, the methodolog methodological considerations for conflict diffusion. Uh, for, and this question is from Eham Male, uh, Al Male, and uh, he suggests a human-centered approach um, uh, that uh, would show the effect on humans. And uh, Kleena, how do we deal with that at ACLIB? Uh, great question. Thanks very much. Um, so there is there's kind of two things happening there, which I think that we we try to address both. The first is, of course, the geographic spread of conflict is important in and of itself. So those, for example, new locations that are affected by violence indicates quite a lot about the strategy of groups and their ability to move and their ability to to transgress administrative borders. Um, and that is quite important to get a sense of how spread out this violence is. But the, the question is well received. In fact, Andrea just mentioned our new project called Conflict Exposure, which directly does what's being suggested there, which is to address really a, a totally different metric of violence, which is the number of people exposed to it. And I think that is uniquely something that will have um, quite a great effect about how we understand conflict, not just events, not just fatalities, not even particularly this wonderfully designed index, but rather how many people have regularly exposed conflicts, attacks, assaults, etc., on their communities and on their families, and um, and how often, or or rather, how regularly does that occur? And we are we are launching that project next week um, with World Pop. It's been um, it's been a really exciting, I think, new endeavor, and we hope it's incredibly useful for people, such as such as the the asker. Thanks, Kleena. Uh, I'll turn now to uh, Katayun, if I may, and uh, could you tell us how you deal with the impact of disinformation on, on your analysis? Uh, this is from Leonardo Agostini at U EUISS in Paris. And uh, do, do you collect data on disinformation? And uh, could you also answer another question we've had in about uh, from Leah Hansen about uh, social media? How do you incorporate uh, social media in your models? Is that uh, part of this? disinformation filters that, that we have? Yeah, so I would say primarily the way we handle disinformation, misinformation is really at the, at the ground level in terms of the data collection stage, uh, making sure that that doesn't enter the equation in terms of what we're collecting and, and analyzing further down the road. So we have really extensively vetted source lists that we use for every country 
um, that includes in some cases social media um, accounts, but again, those are really closely vetted to make sure that they are accounts of either organizations or trusted journalists. Um, we don't just have a sort of a social media Twitter feed um, of information that comes in because those are not verifiable. Um, in terms of the uh, the events themselves that we're gathering. So we take into account the, the sources that we're getting it from, if they can be trusted, uh, making sure that they're not um, known for, for spreading disinformation or misinformation. We also do a check in terms of the data that we do gather to look at trends, to look at how things are developing, cross check them against other sources, um, consult our local partners um, and other experts to make sure that it checks out with what they know to be true on the ground so we have a lot of steps that go into place in terms of, of handling it, in terms of how it affects the data itself. Um, we don't collect data on disinformation itself of the frequency or the occurrences of it. Um, and I can let Andrea address whether or not there's any analysis of the disinformation itself or how that factors in, if at all. But um, for more information on our sourcing methodology, we have lots of information on the website and our methodology uh, documents if anyone wants to, to learn any more. Thanks, Katayun. And um, Andre, you'll be pleased to hear that uh, uh, Rafael Piras is, is saying that having listened to your arguments, uh, this, the, there's support for your choices of this year's watch list. However, there are others people asking questions about why is Ethiopia not there? In fact, there's a lot of interest about uh, uh, all the uh, conflicts that Ethiopia is involved in. And uh, so what was the behind your decision not to mention it this time? Uh, <laughs> it's uh, the I'd say it's uh, the never-ending question we have. Of course, uh, even a major project on on Ethiopia, our uh, Ethiopia Peace Observatory, uh, where we basically monitor and provide analysis on Ethiopia on a weekly basis. Uh, we decided not to include it, uh, largely because of, of course, the number of countries that we had to deal with, and of course, also providing a global coverage in terms of uh, of course there is it's not a hierarchy in terms of you know what what conflict is more important or what conflict is more severe than others of course when it comes to ethiopia uh the uh, sheer uh, influence that ethiopia has on the region when it comes to the horn of africa or even the red sea with all the developments we are seeing about uh, the relations with uh, somaliland project ethiopia definitely in a much uh, in a much broader uh, perspective than what we even were used to uh, consider uh, to consider Ethiopia. Um, I th what we are uh, definitely going to work on in the in our uh, you know <laughs> over the next year is to integrate these uh, regional projects that we that we are undertaking at. Um, at Aklet, uh, whether it's the you know our Ethiopia Peace Observatory or uh, our new uh, observatory on Yemen, and to integrate them because what we are trying to you know uh, move towards is uh, looking at this region even in a, in a in a broader and again integrated scale. So looking at you know the Red Sea as not something that separates uh, Yemen or the, the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn of Africa, but actually as we are seeing with the recent attacks is actually bringing many interests and many risks for every all the countries that are involved in in the region, whether it's Sudan, Ethiopia, uh, again Yemen, Saudi Arabia and Far beyond, like far north to um, to Israel, Egypt, uh, all all together. Uh, so I, I I won't answer on the why because of course again it's a matter of uh, of of uh, uh, dealing with only ten uh, ten um, countries that we wanted to include, but it's something that we are going to follow up very closely uh, in the coming months, actually in the coming weeks. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Fina, coming back to you, there's been a number of questions about non-state actors. Uh, Leah Hansen is asking about criminal groups and their relationships with political actors. Uh, is this uh, something that ACTED takes seriously as, a, as an, uh, an influence in armed conflict? And uh, there's a secondary question about that. 
the non-state groups which are backed by international actors, uh, how, do you ever take into account who is backing who, um, for instance, in Gaza, Palestine, the Houthis in Yemen, and so forth? Um, excellent questions. So, so I think that one of the things that we aim to, to really emphasize, not just with the fragmentation index, with, but more broadly, is that the types of actors that we're seeing commonly populate these conflicts are not, as I mentioned earlier, rebels or more traditional insurgents. They really are these militias, gangs, you know, cartel-like structures. And whereas we would traditionally think of many of these groups, especially the cartels, as having um, an economic motive, so their priority is an economic motive, and that, and really what they're trying to do is to create a political environment that can foster their illicit businesses to flourish. What we've seen, of course, in countries that have significant levels of cartel behavior, especially, is that the political environment, public space, and political political agents or officials become involved in these in these violent contests and of course civilians are at the are are at the mercy of contests between these cartels so when we think about conflict very very broadly and we say you know it's a it's a competition for control authority of territory and populations there really isn't a huge difference between what a cartel is aiming to do in their violent acts you know, between the against the state or against civilians, and what a more traditional group, um, a more traditional, let's say, politically violent group is trying to do. And what I'm seeing more and more is that rather than a country like Mexico being being unique in its combination of factors and its combination of groups, we're seeing that kind of actions around, let's say, as I mentioned, economic motives to keep these groups going, to start filtering into conflicts where we would have traditionally thought of them as highly political, even, you know, to use to use a term that I think we don't use so much anymore, ethnic violence, places like um, places like Nigeria and Sudan. So if I was to take a crystal ball and try to guess what's going to happen in Sudan, I would say that it might look a lot more like the RSF acting like a cartel in a year than them acting like a more traditional group who's trying to overtake the government. And so, yes, we take it very seriously, but I would say that the distinctions between criminal and political groups are no longer as, let's say, established, and they're certainly not miles apart than uh, what we see in practice, which is a real melding of their of their strategies, of their agendas, and of their actions. Um, so separately, those groups that are supported by foreign entities, um, as Andrea mentioned, you know, last year we saw a historic for us as we've been collecting this information, um, an unprecedented increase in the number of countries willing to engage quite directly in the politics and the conflicts of other countries. There was a, it was 16% of all violence involved a country that was not um, the domestic government, which rivaled the engagement of the domestic governments in their own conflicts. And when countries are not necessarily going to invade or contribute forces like Wagner, et cetera, in conflicts, they can often support groups, um, you know, illicitly, for example, like Iran and the Houthis. Um, we don't take, that doesn't influence our coding of the events or of the group or of their actions. Um, so it's it's very important to understand, I think, why a group manages to thrive or why they manage to change course or take a particular political opinion. Um, but in terms of in terms of their inclusion or our understanding of them, their their support by outside entities, which is certainly growing, um, is is another factor rather than a, a determining um, a determining one for entry into our into our analysis. I think that was it. That was indeed. Thank you, Lina. Yeah. Um, Patayun, a couple of a uh, uh, methodological questions, if you don't mind. Um, a couple of questions about how are the coordinates of an event entered and how do you identify which groups are perpetrating the incidents? And also, how can you get such exact information on where things happened? Yeah, that's a good question. So all of our information comes from the sources that we use. Um, so the, we require the sources to tell us basic level of information for the event to be included. This includes 
where the event happened, who was involved, and then some basic details that allow us to classify the type of event that it was. So in terms of who's involved in the event, we include that. We don't include any sort of information about perpetrators um, versus victims other than in the case of civilians, where civilians are always the, the victim and can never be the perpetrator of an event. But otherwise, if you see two actors on either side of an event, that's not an indication um, of which one started it or who's at fault or any sort of a motivational um, statement in that sense. In terms of the coordinates, so we include whenever the source tells us the most exact location, we will include the coordinates of that location. Now, one thing to note is that these are not, we don't geolocate down to you know, a specific street corner. Um, this is for a variety of reasons. One is our do no harm um, mandate in which we don't want to um, isolate in, in that sort of specificity where events are occurring. And also in terms of accuracy, that information is often just not provided. Um, and so we don't wanna be misleading in terms of, of what we're offering, but we do have geolocated data for every event in terms of the exact city where it happened. And in some cases, the exact neighborhood of that city. And we also have a geo precision column that will indicate for the user how certain we are of that location. So if the source was only giving us a general province where something happened, the geo precision scale will uh, will report that. So you know the cases in which we are quite certain of the location that happened, and in cases where we have to code it to a, an admin capital, for example. And a follow up question for you, Katayun, from Sandeep Chintalapalli who notes that we, we say in ACLED that um, our data is collected manually. Does that mean that there's no automated data, data collection? Uh, is there any natural language processing or AI used in the, this uh, collection? So all of our data collection itself at, at the base level is, is manual. So we don't incorporate any sort of large language models or any sort of scraping to, um, to get, gather those information and report it in our case. We are looking at ways that we can use these as tools to help improve efficiency in our collection. So how we can collect sourcing to then be reviewed by people or how we can um, look at coding that can then be reviewed. But at all steps, we are maintaining that level of human oversight because oftentimes what you see with purely machine coded data sets especially when it comes to something as complex and sensitive as conflict, is that there is a lot of inaccurately coded events. There's a lot of uh, miscoded events that come in in terms of um, capturing information about sports events or um, and so on. So we really wanna keep that level of human oversight while still kind of leveraging these tools to improve um, our efficiencies. And then throughout the way, we also have some level of automation in terms of making lives a bit easier when it comes to coding and also reducing um, human errors. So things like um, being able to autom automatically populate certain columns depending on you know what's input into another column, but that's, that's fairly minimal and it's not really, um, it's not a, a machine learning approach in that sense. And a very quick last one, Katayun, mm -hmm. the, the fatalities. Do you ever estimate fatalities, uh, what, do you, what do you do when there is a vague report in the press? So we often, we always uh, resort to the most conservative estimate that's offered. So if we have multiple reports about an event um, that are reporting different numbers of fatalities, we will report the, the lowest number in those cases. We also will go back and amend um, events as, as fatality information comes in. So sometimes you might have an event in which there were a certain number of casualties and perhaps a week later, there's a report about how many succumbed to their injuries. We will go back and update the report um, accordingly. But I do agree that it's often vague. It's often not really indicated. We don't ever um, construct the number of fatalities if that number is not provided to us, or at least um, in some, some information is not provided about the fatality numbers. And we have a lot of information about um, how we deal with fatalities in our methodology documents as well. So I'd recommend looking there on the website. They are indeed fascinating. Read the methodological tabs on the right-hand side of a lot of the, the uh, pages. Um, Andrea, I've got a difficult question for you. There have been a number of uh, attendees who have asked rather heartfelt questions about Africa and about the silencing of guns on the continent. And asking, do you see anything that... Uh, that could be in an answer to the overall nature of conflict in in, Af in managing conflicts in the conflict. Is it possible, the question I asked, um, and what are the possibilities of, uh, of getting back to more serious peacekeeping? 
It's a very difficult question, a tough question. Uh, I'd, I'd answer, well, definitely if we look uh, last year in Africa uh, at the conflicts that have, um, you know, erupted in Africa, uh, we see, I think, mixed uh, signals to some extent, because of course, when it comes to, for example, the conflict in Sudan, uh, it was not unexpected in like the outbreak as such. There were signs preceding the 15th of April that uh, the rivalry, for example, between uh, between the rapid support forces and the army were kind of brewing. Uh, but the the level of violence, uh, the level even of foreign meddling that uh, the war in Sudan has attracted has been uh, has been um, very uh, very severe, and to this day it even protracted. And what we are seeing again, just uh, remaining on on to Sudan is uh, is a perception that. Uh, you know, the conflict can uh, either be solved by outright military victory, uh, by one side on, on the other, uh, or by kind of, you know, uh, a, 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 some sort of settlement between the main warlords that will bring peace to the country. But uh, the risk is probably uh, the more the conflict proceeds is that the kind of the local, you know, uh, conflicts that we are seeing, whether it's in uh, Darfur, uh, Kordofan, uh, they are drawing in a number of, uh, of, of, of actors, of groups on which even the armies that are facing against each other are relying on, will actually spiral into something even more, more difficult to control. And in terms of peacemaking efforts, where, whether regional, or international, I'd say there, is, there seems to be very little space and rather more space for foreign powers interested in uh, fueling conflicts. Uh, this is, I guess, like uh, we, we saw, for example, uh, the former South African pres uh, president, uh, Thabo Mbeki, referring to the conflict in Sudan and particularly to the reaction even by the African Union, for example, uh, mentioning that it was um, utterly uh, inadequate because, of course, there is no, not even an attempt. And again, this is not just uh, uh, kind of uh, regional powers or regional organizations, but even, even beyond that. Elsewhere, like in Congo, in, uh, in the Sahel, we see even, a, I'd say, the decreasing legitimacy of peacekeeping missions. Uh, in Congo, uh, it's not the first year, but there have there has been a trend, especially uh, uh, broken out around the epidemics that we saw in the region of, uh, of course, uh, huge protests, popular protests against the approach by uh, MONUSCO, but not only the approach, also by crimes committed by members of, of the peacekeeping missions. And of course, we also see a rejection in, in the Sahel, for example, of international international missions, uh, MINUSMA, and of course the rejection against French uh, presence in in the region. Um, we possibly see some, of course, hopeful signs in the sense that the elections in South Sudan, if properly planned, are a sign that even a country that was born out of a conflict that went through multiple years of conflict can you know, go through a difficult process and hold even even elections. Even there, of course, making sure that the commit that, you know, all the parties involved in this process are committed to not only respecting the outcome, but also committing not to take guns in, in the process or silencing possible oppositions and, and so on, you know, will be will be crucial. Of course, I can also leave it to to clear not to answer because I uh, have been at the center of her research, but uh I see kind of mixed messages when it comes to to Africa in particular. Pina, do you want to add anything to the general thematic overview of Africa? Is well, there I, such a thing? Yeah, I think Andrea's answer was was excellent and correct, and to say that it's incredibly complex. Um, I will say this, which is that 
one of the things that we have seen, not just in Africa, but but more broadly, is that the diagnosis of conflict has been sometimes off, right? What, what we expect to see and what we see are not the same. And so it causes us to have to rethink what the proposed solutions are for people and for governments to have to deal with this. Because um, Sudan is a really interesting case where there neither of the parties in this case um, want to stop fighting because it's it's quite successful. It's it's necessary for them to effectively determine who's going to be the authority in that country. And so it is in many ways in these parties are indifferent to the, to the amount of civilian harm they're causing. And we come to peacekeeping with the expectation that they're not indifferent and that they want to rebuild this state in a certain particular way. And I think that we need to reconsider the incentives for people to engage, what, what are the incentives for people to engage in conflict and how to mitigate those incentives rather than presuming that um, everybody's on a, a steady march to, to electoral democracy. And as, as, as much as I hope Andrea is correct about optim optimism about South Sudan, one of the things that I've been exploring recently is how all autocracies in, and, and very much South Sudan as a, as a key example, have been able to gerrymander their own political environment in order to secure continued power. Um, and I would expect that we'll see far more of that rather than um, any sort of fair elections. Sobering, Tina, thank you. Uh, we've had a lot of questions as well about how to access ACLED's data. Um, it's quite simple. You sign on to the website, you give us some of your data, and then that opens up the sesame of the 1.5 million data points that have been added in over the years. Um, and Tina, one last question for you uh, from Frederica Riccardi, who uh, says that uh, this is wonderful, powerful information, but she's wondering about how its impact, how is it used? What, what is the uh, what happens when all these uh, data points and analyses are given to the world? Well, um, thank you for that question. Um, well, we make these data available publicly, as as he was just mentioning, and quite a lot of the data, I think, because of its accuracy, its robustness, how well it's updated, etc., get integrated into. Um, international organizations and their planning governments. And of course, it's available to all. And one of our, I think, proudest uh, communities is um, our, our own local partners who are able to use it to advocate for themselves. So um, what we wish for, I think, is, is for people to have an unbiased and independent reading of what's happening in the world and know that we can provide it. And of course, all people require that, not just not just governments. So um, please don't hesitate to, to read the index um, as, as has been made available today and to use the data and to come back to us with questions if there's, if there's more that you, um, you would like to know. Thanks, uh, Tina. Thanks, uh, Andrea. Thanks, Katayun. I think we've uh, come to the end of the questions and uh, to our hour's time. Uh, is there anything else any of you would like to add before we sign off? It looks like we've uh, had our say. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, this uh, for this uh, launch of the 2024 watch list and for our third edition of our ACLED Conflict Index. So I hope you have a very good rest of your week. And uh, you'll join us at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.